functional workflow of, of composition between uh, your sort of DAWs. And the ones that we've worked with this week were Reason and Sibelius. And then of course, we, we as audio engineers typically use Pro Tools um, here. So uh, you guys are very familiar with editing in Pro Tools and working with Pro Tools. And of course, Reason's a little, uh, a little it's kind of in between, you've had time with it. Sibelius is brand new. But the reason I had you open your previous sessions that we worked on on Monday was because I wanted to show you some some different uh, takes that you could uh, approach this with in your functional workflow. So when when I talk functional workflow, the thing is is that you have to go from crafting your composition or crafting your song creation and take it from inception to design and creativity, go through the editing process, go through the recording process, uh, and and then get into your final stages for mixing. Now, here's the thing: in Sibelius. There's no ability to record your voice. So if you wanted to, to take this and then add a vocal, it doesn't work. So you need a, a DAW that you can record audio to. You can do that in Reason. So it's, a, it's available to do it in Reason. Um, but again, if your strengths for you guys, I know your strengths in editing for audio are typically in Pro Tools because you spend most of your time there. So a lot of times what I'll, I'll suggest, and even in my own workflow, if I'm going to record vocals, um, I'll record it in Pro Tools, which means that I'm going to move my instruments or sounds from Reason or even Sibelius and take them to Pro Tools. Now there's a couple options here, okay? When we're talking the functional workflow, there's two questions you have to ask. One, do I like the sounds in the original DAW that it was created in? Two, are there better sounds that can be gained by merging the uh, or moving the MIDI data from the previous DAW to the new one? Okay, so to the one of choice. So in this case, it's Pro Tools is our final destination. So we have two options. One, we can just take the audio from these, these devices and put it in Pro Tools. Uh, or two, we can actually take the MIDI from these devices. But when we take the MIDI, it's only the data, which means we then have to generate or recreate new instruments in Pro Tools. Again, that might be the whole point. So like, if you have a better sound that you want to try to use in Pro Tools, well, a great example, Sibelius. You know, uh, here's the Sibelius you know, stuff we have here. I'm gonna, the stuff we were doing the other day. Let me, um, you know, these were the arpeggios that we were doing that day. My thing is this, if I'm basically saying that there's certain sounds within Pro Tools that, that are not in reasons. Yes. Basically. Okay, well, great example. There's this, right? Okay. And sorry, for some reason, oh, I think for some reason there was a stacking of, I forget why, uh, those parts down in there. So so watch what I'm going to do here, okay? So like uh, a couple things that can be done. One, it, it, it's a little tricky, but I can actually, I can actually add certain instrument plugins, like the Native Instruments contact player that I was just we were just talking about so we downloaded the demos for uh, the string ensemble so that you could kind of walk through these and I could show you what they look like uh, if I were to open this uh, there's a little view here if you go to the mixer in, in Sibelius where you can actually go and tell it from the voicing standpoint where it says s play you can actually tell it uh, that you want you know uh, some sort of different player to actually play the device here well, the thing is, is, and of course you can see all the civilian sounds that are, that are associated here. What we can also do in the configuration is we can actually go to this configuration setup here and say, you know what, we would like to use an additional player here. Um, and let's see if we can find it. Although, oh, sorry, the reason it's not showing up is because I loaded it while this was here. So hold on, let me kick out of this and go back in. Sorry, I have to jump back in it in order to see it. Let it do its thing. Notice you see it, it, now all of a sudden contact is showing up down here in the VST listing. So what's gonna happen is, is contact will actually be able to be playable through Sibelius. The downside to it is it's even the workflow for that is not as functional and as easy to work with as it is in Pro Tools because in Pro Tools, you have a mix window that always shows your active plugins, wherein uh, Sib Sibelius, like using those plugins isn't as easily visible. You have to kind of open up a couple oh, windows so to see. You can use the, um, you can use, 
what is it? The Comcast? Con- contact. Contact on both of them. Yes, essentially, yeah. Yeah, so, so and you can use a lot of third-party other players on here as well. Let me see if uh, it shows up now. I have to, you actually have to go in and to go to this play configuration to actually tell it. Okay, see them here? Use VST AUs. And you can actually choose, uh, let's see if it, uh, let me do it this way. Okay, there we go. I have to switch to this second sound group. You can actually activate, you know, either the VST or the AU version in this instance, and then you're just going to say yes. We want to change the configuration. There is a downside to this. I don't know if you remember me talking about it. One of the downsides to using Contact is that um, it doesn't follow the articulation changes that Sibelius has built in. So when you use the built-in Sibelius sounds. If you decided you were going to write in, remember how we did that last week? I wrote in pizzicato. Uh, right now I have martellato, but if I wrote in pizzicato, it Sibelius sounds, or just did pits, Sibelius sounds will change automatically when I do that. Third-party sounds won't. Um, so that's, that's the downside to it. Once the player is open, you can actually go in and tell it what, what it's going to play. And if you hit the little sprocket here, you're going to get, here's your contact player. And we haven't dealt with this yet, but I'm going to show it to you. Uh, in Pro Tools. Let me just whiz through it here. I'll show it to you in Pro Tools. But from here, I can go ahead and load it up. Again, we're in demo mode, so it's only going to do so much for a certain period of time. It'll time out. And every time I reopen, I have to reload it. But if I hit play from here, oh. Hold on. let me back up to the beginning. <laughs> did. Sorry, I forgot that I moved it to the cello. So let me go back. I'm looking for the cello part. It should be on contact. Sorry, I remember when we did all these ARPs, we changed the so this is just another uh, plugin. Yep. I like the history. I was using the studio and that showed me that. I've been looking for live basses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like all the same thing. Yeah. You just can't do the same. But uh, yeah, I chopped it. But like, he showed, he's playing in the studio and he sounded great. Yeah, Matt Lee Kevin said, you know, he's a, he's a lost. He's a lost. See why this voice here. And you did that through contact? Yeah, it was All the instruments there. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Yeah, and you can make changes to the articulation once it's down here in the window. But articulation changes happen in the plugin. Oh, they don't happen in. They don't happen based upon what you write in in, in, in uh, Sibelius, so that's the problem. <laughs> Sorry, the play is having a bit of an issue. Just get hung up. Yeah, 
you know, but yeah, that's that's what this okay, is. So what you're saying is that, um, yeah. So like, to be the uh, eighth or sixteenth notes, you're trying to add them in. It won't be that same sound as what you said. Uh, no, I'm just saying when we when uh, before. Oh gosh, sorry. Let me uh, get this to do this. But sounds, sound effects, play user interface sound effects. Please do not. Uh, alert volume, nothing. Sorry, all those sound effects, all these stupid sound effects that bop sound that you hear. Mm. Just need to deactivate that. So no, what I was saying is, is, is the difference here is that when I right now, the notice the articulation is that smooth. That was that yeah. smooth sound. When I go back to the, um, uh, although when I go back to reconfigure this to um, Sibelius sounds, oh, right. yeah. what it what it does is in the Sibelius. I'm sorry, the Sibelius player here, and I activate Sibelius player. When I write in, when I just write in uh, uh, this marking that says pizzicata, when I write in pizzicata, it follows it. Uh, whereas, right, and let's, so let's just say I get rid of that. Right, it immediately changes the articulation style based upon what I write in. It will not follow that when you're doing uh, when you're using a third party like contact, it won't follow that. What you have to do instead is you actually have to, in the device itself, you have to, to change the articulation manually here. So that's the only workaround issue that we run into when we're running it through things like uh, Sibelius. Sounds great though, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's a much more realistic version of the, of the sound. The other thing you have to do with these when you're using them in that kind of form is you will actually have to tell it, you see where it says MIDI channel A, one, channel one. If you remember correctly, every MIDI channel, or every MIDI uh, path has 16 channels available. So you'll see from host, meaning from Sibelius, here's our 16 channels. What, in order to, to separate one player from the next, you have to go in and say, all right, well, if I want this one to be a contact player in the mapping, I have to tell it which MIDI channel it's supposed to report to. And when I go make another one, as you begin to make these, you have to tell it who is essentially whose general MIDI you know patch is it using. You can set it to auto, um, but I don't think it works out as well in that in that setup because I think it, it gets confused who it's supposed to report to. Because basically, what that means is when you open it up, it's trying to hear everybody uh, or that's on channel one. If they're all associated to channel one's MIDI. Then it gets a little confused, so that's why it's not as easily a functional item. And you can see how every time I open this, I got to go to the this window here to make this possible. And you have to configure it from the sound output configuration here. It's not as easily fluid as it will be in Pro Tools. So what I'm going to do, what I'm, gonna have, I'm going to have you guys do, um, is let's go ahead and real quick uh, export our MIDI. So go to your score that you have in Sibelius. You're going to go to export. So I'm going to show you. So like, let's just say you created in Sibelius. You use the Sibelius sound sets. Now, what's the pro, what's the pro of Sibelius? Well, Sibelius follows articulation changes, style changes, and if you were to write in crescendos and decrescendos in Sibelius, the MIDI follows that volume change. Okay. So you're going to go to the file ribbon and go to export. So there's a couple ways we could do this. You could have written in, in Sibelius, and you could then want to take it to Reason or uh, Pro Tools, or you could have written in Reason and then try to sling it to Sibelius and then to Pro Tools. Uh, I'll tell you the cleanest way to do it in terms of MIDI, for MIDI's sake, uh, of course, is to write it in something that has a MIDI editor. Uh, Sibelius does not have a MIDI editor. When it comes to writing it for notation's sake, you're better off writing it into a notation software, like again, like Sibelius, because then you don't have the weird workaround things that you'll see where there's duplicate notes or anytime, like when you're writing MIDI, if you accidentally left two notes overlapping each other, mm -hmm. in the score editor, it's gonna represent it as a stacking of notes on top of each other, instead of what you audibly hear a lot of times in the DAWs where it just plays one of those two notes because your, your uh, polyphony is maybe set to one, so it's a monophonic device. So there's a couple weird workarounds you have there. 
Uh, but in this instance, what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that we wrote our, and, we, and you did, you wrote your arpeggiation file in Sibelius. So what we're going to do is we're going to export the MIDI. So you're going to just hit export MIDI. And then it's going to ask, well, how do you want the MIDI exported? There's two ways to do it. Uh, one way is to see where it says MIDI file type, type, type 0, type 1. One way to do this is to tell it that all MIDI is going to essentially be uh, put on one track. And uh, the other way is to tell it that all the MIDI is going to be split into separate tracks, just as it is in your score. By default, that's how, that's how it's set up to do it. So like if you were to hit export, it's going to just drop, it's going to be one MIDI file over multiple channels. So what I want you to do is go ahead and hit export and put it on your hard drive or wherever you're saving all this stuff. Type one or type zero? Type, type one. What does that mean? So that's, uh, well, I'll show you here. That's the, in the type one, I'm gonna put this in the writing sessions. In type one, this is, I'm just gonna call it ARPS from Sibelius, so you keep track of it. from Sibelius type zero. Okay. Do you want us to do type No, no, yeah, I'll show it to you. Just do type one. Okay. Do type one for now. And you can leave Sibelius open. So type one came through. Now let's go to Pro Tools. Now notice these are all going to be singular MIDI files. Although they may represent multiple channels, it's a single file, which is wonderful. Because it's just data, so it doesn't take up a lot of space. What you're going to want to do now is you're going to go import MIDI. And then go find it wherever you put that location. Sorry, my writing session. Uh, okay. Let me know when you get to this dialog window. Golden. All right, once you're at this dialog window, what it's going to ask you is it's going to say, you know, hey, where do you want to put this MIDI? Now, here's the catch, okay? If you're importing MIDI into a brand new session, you want to import the tempo map, you want to import the key signature, and you want to have it set at session start, destination is going to be a new track. If you're importing this to an already existing session, and this is where the change, that little bit of change is, if you're importing this into an already existing session, you want to be very careful to not import the tempo mapping unless you know that the, if the tempo map is the same as the session it's targeting to, the session that it's going into. So let's say you wrote a whole song. You already have a full session with all these instruments here. Then you decided you're going to write some strings for it in Sibelius. Uh, if the tempo map is the same, like let's say it's just BPM equals 120, both, both sessions, import tempo mapping is fine. Or you could just not do it. It won't, it won't actually affect it at all. If you elect to import a tempo map that's different, it'll screw up your session. Because let's say you're, the Pro Tools session's at BPM 150, your Sibelius session was at BPM 100, it's going to bring in BPM 100, and it's going to screw up the tempo mapping for everything in the session. So you want to make sure to be mindful of when, when to bring in the map or when to not bring in the map. Easier done to bring in the map when this is a clean session. Again, you got to be very careful importing the map when it's not a clean session. Um, and then the other... The other thing here is, is that, uh, like, if you do, if you do not, if you elect to not import the tempo map, one issue that you run into is that if you then change the tempo, let's say we didn't bring in the tempo mapping and the tempo was at 100, and it went into the, this session at 120, it's just going to throw it in how it fits, based upon its <laughs> its BPM reference. So, like, it's going to actually move it. 2 BPM equals 120, which might be beneficial for you at the same time. So you bring it into an existing session, you wrote it at 100, you're not sure what tempo it was supposed to be in Pro Tools, don't import the tempo mapping, it'll automatically map it for you as it comes in. So there's that option. In this instance, we're gonna do both. So select both, new track, should look like this. So this workflow we're talking about is if we, in the way that you guys did it the other day, where we built this in Sibelius, and we're gonna bring it into, man, there's still too much light on Sorry, it's a little, I just wish it was brighter. Okay, so, so here we are. 
so, so you have everybody here. And of course, my, my view here is uh, showing way too much information for, for me. I'm going to get rid of this. I prefer to see, you know, for me, I like to separate editing from mix down. So I always prefer my mix window to be in charge of all that, all that instrument routing stuff. So, oh, and even the IO, you know, I just like to save more space. Whoops, save more space for editing. All right, now if we go to the mix window, so what you should see, this is what this is where it gets a little weird, okay? Everything that was just brought in was is brought into a MIDI file. And uh, so everything that was brought in was brought into a MIDI file. Problem with that is, is that we want, we're going to want to use it as an instrument file, an instrument track. So we're going to merge these over into an instrument track. You could use them as a MIDI, MIDI track and route the MIDI to just one plugin. Uh, but I prefer all the plugins to remain separated. So what we're going to do is we're going to go, I mean, and, and even then, depend, how many parts did you guys actually write on? Did you guys write on multiple parts or just one? I only have a video on violin. I got um, violin, violin two and violin. Okay. So if you, if you space it out, then, then yeah, you're going to want to do this multiple times. So, so all I'm going to do is do command shift in. Uh, and I'm going to go to a stereo instrument track. You only need however many you wrote parts for. So, so if you're telling me you only wrote one part, make it one. If you wrote four parts, make it four. I'm going to make four just for now, just for safety's sake. What I'm going to do with these is I'm going to grab all this data. Okay, so I'm just going to grab all these chunks here. I'm going to take them on down to my new instruments. You know, at this point in the game, you can go ahead and delete these. You could get rid of the MIDI, these MIDI tracks now that you're done with them. Highlight them, hold shift, hit delete, say see you later. Now we have these instruments. And then you could retitle these, you know, violin one. If you hold, if you do command down arrow, it'll jump you to the next track. So command down. Uh, what do we do, viola? Command down and chill out. Let me know when you got that far. Get rid of my sense view so it's out of the way. So our MIDI data right now that we took from Sibelius. I just built these arpeggiated rhythms just so you could figure out how to develop really easy arpeggios. And then now we're into Pro Tools with them. In the meantime, I'm going to switch over. Great. All right, you guys okay? Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to select the bar. Uh, or actually, I'm going to select... I'm going to select a phrase. So let me just select. Actually, I might do this bar. I'm going to select the bar, go to options, make sure loop playback is selected so that it'll loop for me. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is on one of the channels, so you can just choose one of your tracks that is actively showing MIDI, highlight it so that it'll loop. And then I'm going to go to the Shello plugin. So now you're going to do, you, you guys are all familiar with plugins. All you need to do here is on one of your, pick one of your instruments that has active MIDI, go to multi channel plugin. You're going to go to instrument. Your instrument will be contact five, the contact five AAX. We're going to open this up. Then you'll see the string ensemble selection here. You're going to click on the instruments <coughs> listing here. So the li you see the drop down come through. Once that drop down comes through, you can bring in either the ensemble. In this instance, you could use it as an ensemble, but notice they also have the parts written out or separately. So you could actually take the, just the cellos, because like, or I'm sorry, just your part that you're using. In this instance, I have a cello part open. So if you're using a violins or a viola parts there, you can highlight those. to change the articulation a little bit.
Did you get that far? Yeah. I would, you can throw your headphones on, check out the different things you could do with this. Now, the big thing here that you must remember is that because your articulations, like we were doing, we were doing arpeggios. You're, you're probably, if they're elongated, you can do legato, the legato sustained articulation down at the bottom. So you don't have to scroll down in the window. Like there's a little scroll options to the, to the side. Scroll down in the window a little bit down there so you can see that. But you want to switch your articulation so that you can see how they work out. Uh, oops. All right, a couple things uh, that you'll you'll notice down here. I want to just point out just a few things, and then uh, we'll keep moving. Uh, so if you look down here at when you're in the articulation view down at the bottom, uh, as you change through these articulations, you'll see th certain things actually change in your options here. Uh, the articulations for sustain, don't, they don't do much here. Again, we're in the string ensemble sy symphony essentials uh, by Native Instruments here. And, and what we're looking at with the sustains is it's very elongated. You can change the release time. A little bit of the expression. And the attack. If you like that kind of sound, but you're better off moving to something that's more actually uh, accurate for how it would be articulated if they had to play this. Uh, not tremolos. And not you see the harmonics. Something more like either staccato uh, or spiccato. But the beauty of it is, is, look if you look at staccato, in the options, you get a couple really cool things over here. You get this section. And, and if you're ever confused, it defines it down here at the bottom if you highlight it here. It says continuous slash random uh, alternative samples for repeated notes are selected either in order or randomly. So what they actually did is instead of using the same sample sets, they're actually using randomized sample sets in order to make it feel like it changes more. You could either do it in this continuous form, you could see the dots go in order, dot, 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 or you can do it in random order and it's using a random selection of them. And then in addition to this, if you add slam, controls the amount of compression for increased impact, so check it out. Versus just a little more impact on the hits. The other thing you could do is in the repetition here, uh, this will actually say this, the speed of repetition being applied as it's being brought through. So it's not changing the notes itself, it's a repetition for the, fra uh, the phrase uh, uh, samples. And then there's an accent point. You can tell it, right now it's set, uh, let's see, I think it's an accent, was it on accent one? Let's go to no accents. Meaning the accents are just vol like for you uh, when we're doing MIDI, so it's velocity, uh, and and in this instance, uh, it's just going to be um, stagnant. But we want to change those velocities to have accents on the one and on the three. Uh, notice it's accent on one three, strong accent on one three, and then accent on just one. Now, the re you can't tell it as much here, but if I were to go to a part in my MIDI, there's a part in my MIDI, I'm pretty sure. Oh yeah, right here, the next phrase. Check this out. It's the same note, right? 
Sorry, I'll turn this up for you. And notice if you have volume troubles, there's a volume option at the top. It's always kind of moderately turned down. And they already have the panning set up a little bit so that at, at the ensemble is placed. If you, if you brought in a full ensemble, all of those parts, they'd already be panned. But notice the volume level here so we can turn this up a little bit. But I'm playing the same note, right? It's the same note. Now it's really going to rely on accents because no accent sounds like this. So let's make strong accents on one and three. And let's maybe change, let's try the, oh uh, no, we're going to want to keep this at 116. Let's do a little more slam, let's do some randomizing. Uh, I hear a little bit of the repeating. Now, check that out. It got all of a sudden really, you hear the bow real strong. Now, actually, let me go and let's have a little more fun with this. Let's take this down into, let's take this down the octave because this is actually quite high uh, for the cello. Uh, I'm gonna, gonna go to an event, event operations, transpose. I'm just gonna drop this the octave. Yeah, now we're talking. Hey, maybe give it a little more slam. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to, you know, get a little more fun with that roundabout as it comes through, so let's give it a whirl. Oh, sorry, one other thing. Let me just see what's going on with the volume change here. Uh, controllers, effects. Huh. Uh, yeah, so that's staccato. We were kind of focusing in on the staccato augmentations, but yeah, you have you, in each of these articulations, you can make changes to how they're used. Again, the accents. These are so much better. Yeah, 
All right, so get you know what? Take the next like couple minutes. Dial in some of those sounds. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna go go to Reason and bring in the Reason MIDI into Pro Tools, that, the Reason session that you built into Pro Tools. That makes sense. Yeah. So let's go go ahead and work on that real quick. Should. I don't know, mine hasn't yet, but is yours? What's it doing? Uh, I, I basically, I took out insert and we're still running. Really? I bypassed it, took it out, and it didn't activate. Make sure you're Sibelius. Here, go back to Sibelius. Make sure, I mean, maybe it's rolling in front from Sibelius. Is Sibelius still open? No, it's not. Here, let me. Is it just holding one up? Oh, it's the same one I was playing one out because I was playing on Oh, that's hilarious. It's just not coming up. That's really interesting. <coughs> did you did it time out on its own or did you just take it off? Honestly, I was just well it didn't work, but it probably did time out, but uh once it started moving out, I was playing it and then it hit a note. And then that Oh, uh, and then you so you're just reactivating it. So I was like, so you say when it times out, you have to close the whole session. No, no, no. You just have to turn off the. You, you, what you do is if it times out, so like when the demo runs out, you're just gonna hit a little X here. It'll close out this window, and you just have to drag it back over. So like it'll basically just time out. You'll close it here. You won't be able to have set saved any of those settings. You'll just drag drag this plugin back into the. So you can actually contact can stay open. The session doesn't have to close. But one thing that happens is as soon as like, let's just say I close this, close the session, as soon as I reopen it, uh, it's going to be in this demo time. See, it says demo timeout. It's going to hit say activate. What that means is buy it. Um, you can reactivate it really by just going back over here or closing this out. Hit the X on the top right and just bring it back in. There it is. And then you just, thing is, is you'll have to remember what settings you had because you can't, you're unable to save those. So you can really just go back and just, you know, make the same adjustments that you had. Really? Yeah. How did it, did it stop? I closed Reason and it stopped. Oh. Reason wasn't moving or anything. Yeah, that's really odd. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, are you re you ready? You guys ready? Okay, that's fine. Just let me know when you're ready. Okay. 
There are, uh, there are in this, there are built-in effects down at the bottom. <coughs> yeah, you see where it says articulations, there is an effect section, so there is compression if you wanted to give it more edge. Uh, EQ if you want to EQ it here, reverb. You know, or you could just, you know, a lot of times what I like to do is maybe a little bit of stuff here, but I'll just run my normal Pro Tools plugins for this so that I process that. Because I prefer, personally, I prefer it to sound as natural as it would in a recording session. Like if I were to record it, maybe I'd put light compression or a light EQ. Right. And I'm really going to do all the heavy duty stuff in the post. So right. I still I treat it like that, you know. Um, okay, so the other thing we can do here now, of course, is we can go to our reason session. So if we go to our reason session real quick. And in our reason session, what we can do here is we are able to do the same thing we did before. Uh, the one thing we're going to want to change, to be honest, is I think when we added these rhythms, is I'm going to want to get rid of... Well, let's see. Uh, you know what? Maybe I'll leave it in there for now just so it's easier. Let's go ahead and go to File. You, you know the drill. Export MIDI file. Uh, and then you're just going to do the exact same thing here. Uh, you're going to export the... But what you're going to want to call it is you're just going to say, like, an, uh, this is ARPS from... ARPS from Reason. Now, the, the difference that we're going to have here is if you import the tempo, which is fine. I'm okay if you import the tempo. You just need to know where because you're not going to want to import it right up alongside of all these guys. So my suggestion would be I think you can do – if you go down to the end of your MIDI and make a selection on the grid, make sure it's on bar one, beat one of the grids, so activate the grid. Make sure the grid is in bar mode. All right, so activate the grid. Make sure the grid is in bar mode. Then we can go ahead and do file import MIDI. And the difference here is, is when we choose the MIDI from Reason, we'll open it up. We will say it's going to go to a new track, import the tempo map, import the key signature, uh, and see where it says remove existing instrument tracks. We're not going to want to do that. But what we will want to do is tell it, instead of, instead of starting from session start, we're going to start from selection. So notice what I had to do in order to do that is I had to go to the bar, a bar, a clean bar after all my other previous MIDI, so I have to be beyond my previous MIDI, make sure I'm in bar mode, make sure I've switched it to grid, go ahead and highlight a, a, a bar, and then you'll tell it import MIDI, and instead of, uh, instead of telling it session start, you're just going to say from selection, down here, see in that drop down, selection, import tempo, because you're going to need it, import MIDI uh, key signature. And then what it should do is it should drop it, and what you'll see up in the tempo mapping up top here, is you should see a clear defined tempo change before. Uh, well, let's see. I don't know why it bumps. What the heck? Hold on. Something happened. Didn't bring anybody in. Oh, that's what happened, I think. Arp cello. Huh. It brought everybody in, but it moved. Shouldn't have done that. I can't undo that. Uh, shoot. Actually, let me restore. Revert to saved. Should have left everybody where they were, but it didn't, unfortunately. File import MIDI. Select <coughs> Yeah, for some reason it keeps, I don't know, did yours do that? Where it moved everybody together? They started. They, well, they didn't even start at the right spot. They were supposed to start up ahead. And they, they were, and they did it. They started from where my other track from Sibelius started. Ah, oh, crap. Hold on. Yeah, let me see if... I, I think we might be able to just resolve it by dragging the other MIDI back. But unfortunately, it screws up the bar, bar listing.
Reason took over, I think. Yeah, shoot. Actually, I'm going to quit Reason now. Actually failed. You know what? Maybe the best thing to do then is uh, if we do. Let's see. Ah, shoot. Uh, we're gonna have to go back in and make the first bar back to your original BPM if you remember it. I don't know if you remember what your original BPM was. Yeah, that's what mine was. Yeah, I mean, the cleanest way to do that, again, is just to kind of throw it into a new, a new DAW, but, or a new um, uh, Pro Tools session with these new tempos, but I just want to have both so you could see them. Now that you have this second grouping, what I want you to do, you know, uh, is pick out your parts. Uh, so, like, you know, the ARP one here is not a real part. And it only brought in anything that had MIDI on it, so, like, I had drums in here that I'm not going to use, but I do have cello. Uh, I do have cello, uh, viola, and bass. I must have never written anything to um, the violin. But now you can go and do the same thing here. You're just going to create, let's see, because I only have three parts of MIDI that are worth using. So you have to hit Command-Shift-N, create three new stereo instrument tracks. Remember how we were doing that before? Now again, you could you could use these as MIDI and throw an aux, create an aux, and route all their MIDI to the to one Native Instruments plugin. It saves DSP, but the downside to it is, is you can't individualize the tones and sounds of each instrument. So what we want to do is we want to go the next step, uh, and we want to when you open them up, how's that? What's that quick key to um, like not have to use your mouse? Oh, to title them. No, like how you just made them, uh, created a new track. Oh, Command Shift N. Yeah, and and from like the create to the stereo. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. So Command Shift N gets a new track. Uh, command, holding Command up or down toggles what type of track. Holding Command left or right toggles mono stereo and, and five point one if it was available. So gotcha. you know that's how you get that toggle. So you, and then you could just type in the number. If you want it, you know how there's this plus sign? That's a shift option down. Or I'm sorry, shift command down. Shift command down, up and down. If you want to do some of those. But yeah, now that you have these, you can go ahead and, and move the MIDI that you want. I'm just only going to take these guys. Throw them here. And go ahead and delete these. guys so I'm gonna just you know keep essentially keep creating now in your contact player just remember just like any other plugin you can always hold option as to copy it and drag it mm -hmm. to make multiple instances you just have to you're gonna have to go back into each one and you're gonna have to 
get it out of the demo timeout, change it to the sound that you want. Yeah. Fix it. Yeah. Fix it. Yeah. 
Yeah, not too bad, right? All right, I'm gonna dump this over actually. Thing I noticed, you know, one thing I noticed on here, they, they built it quite smart, wisely. But if you slam it too, if you use the slam function too hard, it actually detunes the note. Yeah, mm -hmm. just make it that. Mm -hmm. This one's just kind of goes. Rrr. Yeah, show them how to use these uh, native instruments. Wow, and these are these are all demo modes, so they'll time out eventually. I think it's really cool. Wow, just killer stuff. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Are they expensive? The, these ensemble ones are a little pricey. Uh, I think they were like. 
two hundred dollars. Oh my section. goodness! <laughs> but they're beautiful. Yeah, these would sound really good. This has got a real good. They have a lot of cool options. Jeez. Ooh, that's beautiful. Thank you, dude. I really appreciate it. How's your morning going? Awesome. Randy just showed up. <laughs> uh, and you, you're getting the documents she needs, right? You had the documents oh, set aside. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank you for reminding me. You got it, man. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, okay, so we just pulled in from Reason and we pulled in from Sibelius. So kind of to wrap that up, you see, you know, we essentially we were able to take these instruments, throw these in here, take these, oh, although I got rid of Reason, we took the Reason stuff that we built there and throw it in here. And you can see, like, the, there's a bit of a difference just in the, even what you did from, the, from one to another. Um, in Sibelius, you see this. Okay, so here's our Sibelius group. Sound like something in a movie. Yeah, that's good. I mean, you're getting right. It's getting there. It's really cool. If you go to Window in Pro Tools and now you go to Score Editor, it may take a moment to load. But now what you should see is you should see these parts back out onto a score. The only difference here is uh, that the Score Editor needs to be told a couple of things in order to clean this stuff up. So if we wanted to go back to score, or maybe we wanted to just write either, let's say we wrote in Reason, okay? So if we wrote in Reason and we wanted to go to score, but we wanted to use Pro Tools as, as our either our sound editor, let's say we didn't like the sounds in Reason and we wanted to use the sounds in Pro Tools to use these native instrument plugins, we go into Pro Tools, now we're ready to go to score. One thing we can do is we can clean up this score here if we use the score editor, and we could tell it, uh, let's go ahead and send this to Sibelius when we're ready. And we don't want to do it until we're ready. And you can see, obviously, like, Track names in Pro Tools are very different than they're going to be on a score. A lot of times in Pro Tools, your track names, you know, you might have, you know, like in this one, I put uh, Viola Reason to keep track of which ones are from Reason, you know, but in reality, it's, you're not going to want to, to say that on the score. So you're going to want to make adjustments to, to these kinds of things. But one of the big adjustments that needs to take place here is everybody's automatically by default listed on both treble and, uh, and uh, bass clef which isn't accurate, you know. Uh, so we have to choose a clef for the groupings. So one of the things we're gonna do is, is if you right click on the, uh, where is it? If we go score setup, uh, you can put some of the general information here. Notice it just says title at the beginning of it. It doesn't even use your session name. So like whatever this was supposed to be called, you know, let's just say this was ARPS, composer is your name, right? 
you're going to drop this info in before you send it to Sibelius because it'll be easier to work out over there. And there's a couple options here, things that it displays, bar number, things like that. And then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go to the individual part. So let's say we went to this, I can see the bottom line cello. If you click on these individually using this little dot over on the side, it'll show them independently, which is kind of nice. So this is the cello by itself. If you right click on it and we go to notation display track settings, we can say, hey, instead of using the grand staff, which is both, yeah, this needs to be on just bass clef alone. And there we see the part written out as it should be. Now, one of the issues is that we talked about in the past with this, and this one, I think this version of the cello, where is it? Uh, how the heck did that get off? Somehow this, is, this turned out to be off by two bars because of the tempo change. So like for some reason, this, this pick, these, these pickups should have actually started on the bar. If I remember correctly, let me take a look at it just real fast. Let's see, ooh, yeah. For some reason the bar recount got way out of whack when you know when we opened up or loaded the um, when we loaded the, the strings from uh, Reason, it messed up what was going on in our other group. So what I'm going to do is, oh no, I'm sorry, where was I? Oh no, I was on Jello. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore all the stuff that I had in from Sibelius, and I'm only going to work with the stuff that I brought in from Reason. So let's just say, like right now, I'm seeing this bass reason. There's a lot of rests in the front end because of the fact that I moved it down a few bars. So in this group, again, I'm going to go to bass clef. Notice how much it cleans it up. The other issue that you see here, uh, one issue that you see here is these are way off the staff. You see how far these are off the staff? What we can do about that is, is what we, we can do with it is just in the notation display track settings, there's something that says display trans, transposition. So we're going to actually, for the display purposes, transpose this up the octave. You see how we did it there? See what we did if it was at zero? See how far down these are? And if we take it back up, they're displayed actually on the staff. The other thing is, is there's also something known as display quantization, which would say if we, were, if we didn't want to quantize the actual performance, but for the display purposes for notation, we we're like, these need to be quantized so that they don't look so wacky, we can change that. We can also straight swing. We can allow note overlap, or we could deactivate note, note overlap here, which is a wonderful thing to be able to do, and that's in the global sections. And if you want to do these part by part, you would tell it part by part, please do this. Um, so base, for the most part, base is handled, okay? What we could do if we really wanted to get rid of this is we'd have to get rid of these bars on the front end. We could do that with the session. I'm going to go to, cello, to this cello here. Same thing, what am I going to do? I'm going to right click on it, go to notation, display track settings. I'm going to send these guys to bass clef. Again, it cleans up the part. Uh, for this other one, this one actually, this one really is more, I think the range actually goes down into the cello, but I think a violist could, could manage playing this. Uh, I'm going to put this for now, uh, I think we can get it in, oh, no. I'm going to put it. Oh, an alto clef. <clears throat> I'm gonna put it in alto clef, and in alto clef, it seems to fit the right part. But again, if that if it were cello, it'd go to alto clef. You could do it, or uh, sorry, if it were viola, it'd be an alto clef. If it were cello, you could actually put it in either treble or bass. But it's gonna change where it's at. If I put it in bass, the notation's perfect where it's at. You can see it falls inside of the staff. If I go to the viola here, because I didn't have a violin part, right click it again. Notation display track settings. I'm going to tell it to go to alto clef. Everybody should fit correctly, and you see that they do. Uh, and there we go. So then here it is here it is the score, and if I bring them all together and highlight them all by activating all their parts there, you see them as a grouping. The only issue, again, is that uh, we need to switch some of the names. So like this name would go to cello 2, and I'd get rid of the, the, the reason and, and it's just uh, going to clean this up a little bit. Oops. Hold on. I don't know if it will let me do this because I already have a track named that. Yeah, I said it's a problem with this. So maybe I'll just say Viola. Okay. Uh, and then there's those parts. And again, with those dead bars, I'm just going to save this real quick. What we could do with these is if we were just to remove the dead bars, and let's just say, for the sake of this session, um, 
I want to go and I want to delete in time operations. I'm just going to cut time, cut the selected time, hit apply, and then I can go back to my uh, score editor. And now you should see everybody set up. There's a pickup down in the cello uh, for this one. Is it because of, oh yeah, it's a carryover from the last phrase. Some still actually, there's still an actual dead bar left. And maybe that's why the phrasings are off. Because there's a weird, whatever this is, quarter note. Yeah, it's got a quarter note value at the beginning right here. That needs to be cut. So if I go back and cut more time, there we go. Go back to window. Here's my score now. Oh, why did that shoot? Oh, because the bar. Dang, this is so weird. Sorry, when I cut that, the bar moved. Public count. Session start should be here. Move song start when you do that. Apply it to right where it's at. Renumber song start to one. Let's see if that'll do it. There we go. Except there's still a dead bar. Yeah, so it's a little quirky because we end up with a still end up with a dead bar here. Uh, oh, because somebody's still in it down below. Dang, that sucks. Even though the bar, notice the bar number at the top here is titled bar number zero. See it? Bar zero. Which it should be bar one at the beginning. So really this is the beginning. So that's it. I mean, again, it, it kind of shows you why it's such it's so much easier if you start off with a clean clean MIDI. I merged those two sessions just so you can see it. But, the, but essentially there you are with your score. We, sent, we go in and send this to Sibelius. All of a sudden, what we just did in uh, what we just did in Reason, we threw it into Pro Tools to get a better sound. <coughs> now, all of a sudden, we get to have to use this in Sibelius. We have to. We will have to make a few additional minor adjustments uh, for to to set it up. But and then add any articulation, any crescendo, decrescendo. But look at it. I mean, it's it's pretty spot on. You go through it. Play it. Play. Now it's throwing everybody on piano because by default we didn't tell them which voices to use. But everybody's where they should be octave-wise. You could go in back to play, and if you go to the mixer, just go in and say, "All right, well, uh, you know." Everybody needs to go back to some form of some form of string configuration. So we go back to the second group that we used here, where we had contact five associated. And again, we could just jump in and say, "All right, you're going to be all of you guys are going to be a contact player." You know, and set them up the same way we had them before. So you know, oops. Uh, well, of course, with all that being said, um, there we go. And there's our there's our ability from a functionality workflow position to get from either from, we went full circle. We went from score to Pro Tools to 
that made a really cool sound. We went from Reason to Pro Tools, made a cool sound, and back to Score. So uh, you have to choose, you're going to have to choose what kind of workflow works best for you. There's obviously a couple of complications in this. One of the complications that you see uh, in pros and cons as well is if you were writing this to, let's say we're in Sibelius, uh, let's go to file and let's go to just do a search for some video. Okay, and we have to in our view panels, video. Thing I forget where we bring this part in. Sorry, there's a way to bring in video there, but I'm going to bring in video to Pro Tools in the meantime. Obviously, one of the issues that we run into with Reason is Reason does not have the ability to, to sync video. And that becomes a huge issue because of the fact that it means that we can't just, you know, you can't just open some sort of video and throw it in synced to your session, where you can do it with Pro Tools and you can do it with Sibelius. I think we're going to go ahead and end here and take a break.